My name is John Wall. I'm here at the uh, Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. I want to welcome you all to our session. Um, in some way, the center thinks of this as a family affair. Um, we're glad to have Abdullah here. Contemporary events in the Muslim world in general and in uh, the Arab world in particular have highlighted some really important issues in terms of how do religious organizations or organizations that are labeled as religious organizations operate within uh, the contemporary context of modern politics. Abdullah has been working on a concentrated period in the history of one of the most important of the modern Muslim organizations, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And uh, I would point out that we are here then to talk about answering the call, uh, popular Islamic activism in Sadat's Egypt. Um, we have uh, little propaganda blurbs here, should you be interested in, you might just pass them around. But this is not just a study of 10 years of modern Egyptian history. This is a study that looks at how do organizations that are thought of as religious operate to mobilize sentiment and to gain support uh, for their programs. Uh, and Abdullah, uh, I can remember as we first started talking about this, um, it was, a, it was a unique kind of project in the sense that it is far enough away in time so that there's some real perspective. You can sort of see what happened. Were, were these guys right? Were, uh, and, and so on. But at the same time, it's near enough to us so that many of the people who were involved in the important events are still around and still have memory of what it was that they were doing. And so that Abdullah, I mean, some of you as, you, as you look at research, historical research, a lot of times you have to wait for the documents in the archives to get opened. And by that time, everybody's dead. Uh, uh, but this, the, the 1970s, uh, the, the project that Abdullah undertook then was something that had a double set of resources, and he's done a wonderful job with it. Now, um, Truth in advertising, I did write a foreword for the book uh, because I thought it was an important book. But at any rate, I, uh, uh, Abdullah is now in the Georgetown family in Qatar uh, at the, uh, in the SFSQ, uh, and we welcome him here. Thank you very much. So I guess I'll just I'll stand here to make sure that uh, everybody um, can hear and, and see in the back. That means you, you've done enough now in the classroom, so you want eye contact right. with everybody, yes. right? Um, well, first of all, I, I have to say thank you to everyone at ACMCU um, and to talk, Dr. Vol for, for being here and, to, uh, and for, for moderating this, uh, this conversation. Um, of course, Dr. Vol not only wrote the foreword for the book, but he was actually my dissertation mentor during all of the many years that I was here as a graduate student uh, in the Department of History at Georgetown. Uh, have many, many memories, specifically just in this room, most of them very good. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's really fantastic and so wonderful to be back at Georgetown, kind of where this, this project really began um, some years ago. Um, and I take it that many of us are here in large part because we've, we've been following events in Egypt and we're very interested in what's happened, right? Most of us were kind of watching very closely in 2011 when the protests began on the 25th of January. We saw the kind of hope of people who were finally coming together, mobilizing to try to rid themselves of a 60-year authoritarian regime, to try to bring about something of a representative state, something that actually represented the will of the people and not just the will of a very select few, uh, whether from the military or from the kind of uh, you know, business elites and the political cronies of the Mubarak regime. Um, and so here we are four years later, and it seems for many of us at least who continue to watch what's going on in Egypt, that a lot of that uh, hope appears to have dimmed quite a bit. 
Um, and many of us, of course, will continue to ask why. Well, what has happened, especially those of us on the outside kind of looking in at the events in Egypt? What is it that's happened that has taken Egypt from a situation where it seemed like it was on the brink of some kind of, if not revolutionary change, at least a kind of bringing about of a kind of institutionalized democracy, potentially, uh, that was going to protect the rights of people to a regime that has been responsible for some of the worst human rights abuses in modern Egyptian history. When we think about, of course, the, uh, you know, the Rabah massacre in August of 2013 that followed the coup by just a matter of weeks. When we think about the 41,000 Egyptians who currently languish in prisons. When we think about the mass death sentences that are being handed down by the Egyptian judges. Uh, when we think about the fact that the, the people who um, were rising up against the Mubarak regime in the first place, many of them, of course, find themselves in prison, while Mubarak and his family and their cronies are all, of course, been exonerated, acquitted, and uh, find themselves free from any accountability for all of their transgressions against Egypt. And so I don't pretend that I'll be able to answer the question of why this is the case, but I'll at least try to handle one element of that. And so at the heart of all of this conversation, uh, tends to be the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? That here's this political party, this social movement, this organization uh, that is at the center of all of these questions of, of what has happened to Egypt throughout uh, not just the last four years, but in fact even just the developments uh, going back many decades. Um, and depending on who you talk to, the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, is either completely responsible for these events or on the other end, the only safeguard, at least for the revolution during those years. And so these are kind of two very parallel, very uh, opposing narratives that we've heard over the course of a number of years. And I'll try to kind of um, get back to this question. But I do think that the question of history is very uh, informative, that, that in order to be able to actually understand what's been happening in the last few years, I constantly make the case that history is significant, that it's not enough just to kind of look at the surface and try to understand this movement in light of just the recent decisions that it's made, but rather more in terms of the, the long-term developments of the organization. Um, and I think this is important for a number of reasons, because when people look at the Muslim Brotherhood as an organization, they tend to uh, take it outside of history. They look at it as this organization that simply you know, was born out of this ideology by Hassan Banna in the late 1920s and 1930s. And all of a sudden, this, this ideology has kind of carried it forward. And so this is how you get this narrative today in which you simply have the military on the one hand and the Brotherhood on the other hand, and then all of Egyptian society is just somehow kind of the victims of, of this eternal conflict between these two forces. And you know, people are just kind of held hostage essentially by that conflict. I don't think that that's a very helpful way to look at it. I think the Muslim Brotherhood, if we see it as, as a social movement that in many ways is an outgrowth of its own political context from which it arose, and if we look at the broader historical developments within Egypt over this time, I think we'll, see, we'll, we'll find a much better way to try to understand its role in Egyptian society and then more recently, of course, in Egyptian politics. And so one of the first things that I think is important is to try to distinguish between the different historical periods. And so it's not sufficient just to simply point back to the interwar period and say the Muslim Brotherhood organization that develops there, the ideology, the program of that, of, of that movement is the same exact organization that we're looking at uh, all the way up to you know, 2011, 2012. Um, in fact, the organization goes through a number of, of very important, significant developments, which I try to uh, highlight in the book. And in fact, the organization disappears from the landscape of Egyptian society for the better part of two decades, beginning, of course, in the 1950s, when Gamal Abdel Nasser takes over and decides that he wants to completely recast the way that Egyptian uh, politics work in terms of isolating uh, the government from all popular expressions within society, whether it's the Brotherhood and the Islamists, whether it's the leftists, communists, liberals, no social organization is able to really kind of express itself freely during the course of uh, the Nasserist era. Um, and so in, in that sense, I think the organization that emerges in this early period um, at a time when Egypt at that point was still struggling through continued colonialism with the continued British presence struggling with the rise of these kind of traditional landed uh, elites, the political elites, uh, you know, primarily as we see through the West Party, and of course the monarchy itself, which was the focal point of a number of the protests and people who kind of wanted to rid Egypt of um, the corrupt monarchy. And so th that political context that exists during the so-called liberal experiment or the liberal era uh, in modern Egyptian history is not the context that exists certainly beginning in the 1950s and then, of course, in the 1970s when the Brotherhood does make its kind of comeback. 
Um, and so I think that those, those contexts are very significant because it does tend to dictate the organization as it reemerges. And so in 1954, when Gamal Abdel Nasser finally kind of asserts his control, he outlaws the Muslim Brotherhood, he imprisons most of its leadership, some of them are even executed. Um, the, the organization itself is mostly dismantled, many of them end up in exile, um, and we don't really hear anything more about them for the better part of the next 20 years. Um, and with the exception of kind of some of the prison debates, we hear of course about the 1966 and the 1965 conspiracy involving Sayyid Qutb. His, he's executed in 1966, and so people tend to kind of just trace the trajectory of Islamic activism in Egypt on the basis of what's going on in the prisons, people who are becoming supposedly radicalized and deciding that the state has now made politics into a zero-sum game, and so there's no kind of negotiation with a military regime that has completely banned any kind of outward expressions of, of political preferences, and so therefore this is now going to turn into a militant movement. Well, certainly that is part of the story that's been told, and it's been told quite well by people like Gilles Capel and others. Uh, but that's not exactly the entire story, because at the same time that that side of the debate is happening, you also get a pushback from people who are within the core membership of the Muslim Brotherhood, in fact, part of the leadership. So Hassan al-Hudaybi, who is the second general guide after Hassan al-Banna, uh, issues a book in the 1960s called Dua al Quda, Preachers, Not Judges, in which he's kind of combating this, this uh, turn toward the kind of militant extremism that you start to see coming out, not necessarily from Sayyid Qutb, who's I think whose views uh, have been misrepresented quite a bit, but by people who are his followers, right? People who kind of take those ideas and then begin to establish a different, um, a different paradigm of Islamic activism that involves underground activity, being far more militant, being far more um, confrontational with the state. And so this, there's another point of view that says, no, our job simply is to just preach the message and it's up to society to either accept it or to reject it, but our responsibility doesn't go beyond simply being a social movement that is active within society. The question is how that movement is going to be allowed to operate, and at that point, that, be, that remains an open question. Um, and so we'll put kind of a pause on that debate for a moment, because I think the real aspect, especially when I was doing my research, the, the real findings have to do with what was going on on the ground within Egyptian society by people who were not in the prisons, by the youth, by this emergence of a new generation in the early 1970s that is beginning to kind of express itself far more politically. Now this coincides with a number of very important developments, of course the transition from Nasser to Sadat, the defeat of the 1967 war, the kind of collapse of the entire Nasserist project with all of its kind of you know, Arab nationalist socialist <coughs> rhetoric the kind of radical stances that Egypt had taken in the region up to that point, that all of these things kind of coming to a head by the late 60s really energizes a new generation that's going to kind of invent a new format of protest that we haven't really seen the likes of that before. Uh, we see it in the 1968 protests. Of course, we know that was a big year of protests globally. Egypt was no exception, that there were a lot of uh, mobilization specifically among the youth that was non-ideological in nature um, that, that certainly there wasn't a strong Islamist presence at the time. But this was a movement that, of course, was very frustrated with the kinds of policies that Nasser had pursued, with the failure to deliver in the 67 war after many years of kind of building up uh, the potential for liberation of Arab lands. And so what ends up resulting from that is a kind of not just a collapse of Nasser's project, but a shift from the Egyptian state beginning in the late 60s, even before Sadat. Of course, Sadat is credited with taking Egypt into the kind of Western orbit, to warming up relations with the United States, to cutting off Soviet assistance. Uh, but this was a process that was actually already at work even in the late stages of the Nasser regime, that he had already kind of accepted the Rogers plan and he was kind of looking at ways of reorienting uh, Egyptian policy. So this was something that was al already kind of several years um, in the making. And so, the result of this, I think, in many ways, is, is it, it shows that there's both a state and society shift uh, that's taking place within the early 1970s. We see it, of course, Anwar Sadat deciding that he wants to legitimize his presidency on a very different basis than Nasser did. Rather than the kind of Arab nationalist uh, credentials that Nasser had built for himself, Sadat wants to be seen as the believer president. So he actually reintroduces religious imagery and identity back into Egyptian society in hoping that he'll use that to kind of elevate his status among the Egyptian people. Again, we're still talking about a military regime in which succession is happening in a very kind of arbitrary way. 
there's not seen as kind of an automatic legitimacy conferred upon whoever happens to be taking office. And so there's, there's this project of kind of building the presidency around a particular uh, personality. And in this case, it happens to be Islamic in nature. And so in many ways, this introduces something very different to the, uh, to the landscape of Islamic activism. The fact that the state now has become a very active uh, participant in the landscape of Islamic activism and uh, you know, popular discourse. Uh, and so we see this primarily not just through kind of Sadat's adopting it in his own um, persona, but we also see it in the way that he's pursuing policies, right? That he's actually st starting to um, deny the leftist and the kind of old political powers uh, within the universities and within other institutions of the state, the same kinds of privileges that they'd enjoyed under Nasser, and instead allowing for the rise of an Islamist current within the student movement. Now, one of the things that has been at issue in this discussion for a number of years is whether Sadat actively creates the Islamist trend, right? That this has been one of the ongoing narratives, is that, well, the Muslim Brotherhood only exists after the 70s because Sadat actively created them. He, he you know, he's sort of through his, his different channels decided to create an Islamist current to fight off the Nasserists. And I think that that narrative has been overstated. It's been overstated because we don't have any real direct evidence of this. We know that they've certainly tried. We know that he had a number of people within his government who were very actively engaged with the student movement. But we don't actually see that the Islamist movement that was emerging within the campus is ever actually is taking its directives from the regime or certainly not serving its interests, especially when you consider the fact that they were just as likely to be as critical of Sadat's policies, everything from you know taking in the Shah of Iran in the late 70s to the Camp David Accords to the uh, economic policies, the liberalization measures that we saw, of course, um, being opposed in the 1977 bread riots, which was the biggest mobilization in Egypt until the 2011 um, uprisings. And so in that sense, we don't actually see that there's any real direct coordination between the state and the Islamist movement that's emerging um, within the campuses. Um, and so on the social level, I think there are a number of important things that are happening that in many ways are indirectly enabled by the kinds of changes that Egypt is experiencing um, during this period. And a lot of these are very much um, coming from the kind of socioeconomic terms, right? That you start to see a greater uh, move of urbanization, younger people coming from the countryside and the villages, they're far more conservative, they're coming into the universities. The enrollment at most of the Egyptian universities has doubled by this point from the Nasser era into the early years of the Sadat period. Um, you start to see opening of new universities in places like Upper Egypt that they didn't have them before. Um, and so all of a sudden the kind of landscape of student activism is going to change because of this kind of strong demographic shift. Um, and so this begins primarily through these small religious societies that ultimately decide that instead of just kind of engaging in basic, you know, ritual worship and kind of coming together for Ramadan fast and for Friday prayers, that they actually want to be a little bit more politicized. So they're reading kind of a greater depth of the different religious literature that's in existence at this time. Um, they're also you know, confronting a number of the school policies that they find to be offensive or un-Islamic and trying to kind of get changes done on that local level within the universities. And one of the first things that they learn is that in order to do that, you have to be part of the system, as it were. And in this case, the system involves being part of the student unions. And so this direct engagement with the student unions, I think, is one of the first major developments that happens for this rejuvenated Islamist movement in the 1970s. And in many ways, if we look at this as part of a long-term trajectory, we see that this is how the Muslim Brotherhood eventually will start to kind of take on state um, in interaction and engagement with the state going into the 80s and 90s and beyond, when we, when we actually start to see them running for parliament. Before that, of course, they're running for the professional syndicates. And before that, we see them in the student unions. Now the student unions is a very strategic position to be in because it gives you access to resources, it gives you access to um, the kind of policy making agenda for, for the actual um, politics of the campus itself. Uh, and so this is one of the things at least that, that I would argue is why the Brotherhood kind of takes on the posture that it does uh, beginning in the 1980s when it becomes far more invested in the kind of state institutions in a way that historically had never really been the case up to that point. Um, so we see this kind of happening on a couple of levels. First, you know, there's, there's this kind of active engagement. And secondly, we still see a, a, a real push for um, greater coordination, organization of the student movement itself. They're having these lavish summer camps in which they bring in a number of uh, you know, the, the most elite Islamic scholars, people like Yusuf al-Qaradawi, 
Muhammad al-Ghazali are coming to kind of preach to um, the, the, the sort of the youth movement, the student movement at this time, um, we see that they don't really distinguish between the various ideological trends within the Islamic movement. And I think that that's another real important marker of this period is the fact that there's this ideological fluidity. They're not just beholden to kind of one school of thought on anything, that they absorb just as many kind of you know, conservative Salafi literature, people, you know, fiery preachers like Abdul Hamid Kishk, to the kind of state establishment preachers like uh, Mutwali Sharawi. Um, and so, and everything kind of in between, they're also experiencing at this stage, especially after 1973, when uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, through its, its sort of recent oil boom, is able to actually push forward all of the kind of Wahhabi literature and exporting it in droves, and so they're also being exposed to that kind of literature in a way that I think you end up with a substantive change in terms of just even the outward makeup of what the student movement looks like in terms of its activism during the late 1970s. And I'll get back to that point, at least when I talk about the differences between them and um, the older generation. But I think that, that this ideological fluidity is seen as something that's quite dynamic that it lends itself to the ability for this to be an amorphous movement that's able to, to be able to kind of be all things to all people throughout this period. It's able to grow exponentially. You end up having tens of thousands of young Egyptians that are kind of joining in on the Islamic movement, Islamist movement during this era um, in a way that tends to avoid, at least in the early period, the kind of deep ideological divisions and the kind of fracturing that we start to see later on. Um, and so this leads to a kind of empowering of this movement. Um, and then, of course, you get to this point of, well, what next? What happens after you know, this generation kind of grows up, matures, decides that they want to take this, their activism sort of to the next level, go beyond simply the university campuses. They want to be able to challenge state policy um, through government, through other kinds of mobilizations that go even beyond just what's available within their universities. Well, this is how the Muslim Brotherhood kind of enters into the picture. At this stage, the Brotherhood had uh, been a shell of its former self. I mean, it didn't really exist as an organization in the early to mid-1970s. We're talking about an organization that in the late 40s had a million members, and by the time you get into the early 70s, you're really talking about maybe 100, and 100 to 120 members that are still sort of actively identifying themselves as, have, as being part of the movement that are in prisons at this stage. Um, and so as part of his kind of warming up to the Islamists and trying to kind of turn a new page, Sadat starts to release them gradually from the prisons, but with a very clear expectation that the Brotherhood is still an outlawed movement, that this is not an organization that will be ever allowed to reform uh, or to reorganize in a way that will be recognized by the state. And so while they appreciate the fact that they've all been freed from prison after 20 years, many of them are, are kind of beginning to have this debate internally of what should the nature of the organization be, if there is going to even be one. So I think that this idea that, there, that the return of the Brotherhood was even inevitable is also something that's been overstated because there was never a guarantee that this was an organization that was going to simply return back to the fore of Egyptian society. This was a very long-term kind of uh, process and there was a lot of heated internal debates. There were some people that said, well, maybe we should just kind of have it as a, as a sort of loose affiliation, a publishing house, we'll just have some magazines, people could kind of be influenced by our thought, by our, by our ideas, but we will not have a centralized organizational structure, we will not have membership, we will not take in any new members. Um, and on the other extreme, you had people who said, no, the, the only purpose of the Muslim Brotherhood is to be an organized structure, because mobilization cannot exist or cannot really take place as an, in an organized fashion without having that kind of strong structural hierarchy, the internal discipline, the kind of indoctrination that takes place within the movement. And so these were the kind of competing uh, schools of thought. Omar al Tirmisani was seen as kind of a, centr a, a centrist figure who sort of sympathized with both sides and said, well, let's try to have something of a combination of the two in which we will still be a, a kind of a broad preaching organization, but one that also will uh, find a way to, you know, at least have some small group of membership, some institutions, things through which we can kind of actively mobilize and do things. Well, that may have been the original vision, but it was really kind of that second viewpoint that ended up taking hold, especially when we see what goes on um, in the early 1980s. And so as this conversation was being had in the, in the early to mid 70s, necessity, as some would argue, uh, forced the uh, uh, people who were kind of in that position of arguing for a strong internal structure to say, well, given the landscape of what's going on with student activism today, we really need to find a way to kind of provide direction, to 
provide structure, to provide organization for the kind of wayward youth. And a lot of this actually has to do with the rise of these kind of underground militant um, movements that are existing. So in many ways, uh, the case could be made that the Brotherhood enters as a kind of moderating force for the kind of zealous youth activism that's taking place in the 1970s. And we see that primarily through the fact that in the places where the Brotherhood was weakest, like in Upper Egypt, for instance, are the places where you do start to see the rise of the kind of uh, militant activity that takes place by the late 1970s, the ones who were responsible for kind of various attacks against the state, and ultimately, of course, those who were responsible for the assassination uh, of Anwar Sadat himself. Um, in the places where the Brotherhood tends to have greater influence, you, you see far less activity of that kind. And in fact, you start to see that the leadership of the Islamic movement within the universities are the ones who are actually um, joining in the Muslim Brotherhood by the late 1970s. And so this process of co-optation is one that the Brotherhood, of course, believes was in uh, now, in, in hindsight, would argue was kind of a historical inevitability, it was something that was a necessity, that it was the only way to kind of continue to guide the movement at a time when internal divisions were really beginning to appear. Um, in Alexandria, for instance, where the Salafi movement was far stronger, you start to see very strong internal divisions within the leadership of the student movement, the people who were Salafi, Salafi and those who were um, non-Salafi or you know, part of the kind of more mainstream um, brotherhood sort of ideology. Um, and so on their side, they would argue that the Brotherhood enters as a devi divisive force, right? That they're there to kind of force people to make these decisions and to make these choices of you can't simply, you know, have a fluid ideological orientation. You kind of have to pick and choose what kinds of things you're going to um, take on as your official positions on, you know, whether it's matters of personal piety and practice or even things having to do with your involvement in uh, the political system. Um, and, and we see this playing out in a number of different debates. So one of the interesting things, for instance, is you see that among the youth movement, there's far more emphasis on outward piety. And so when they saw all of these elder brotherhood figures who were coming out of prisons, who didn't have you know, long beards and who weren't dressing in traditional clothes, they were quite horrified. And so Omar al Misani and others would say, well, we just, you know, we grew our beards because that's what they wanted us to do. And they wanted us to give them, you know, or this would give us a sense of legitimacy uh, internally within them. And so that was something that we had to do. Um, but then on other things, there was a little bit more pushback. So for instance, on questions like, you know, is music permissible in Islam? A number of the youth would have said no, and you know, we, we wanted to stay away from music. And again, a lot of this comes from the kind of uh, Salafist kind of influences. Uh, so Amr al Misani would sort of stand in front of everyone and recount his youthful days when he would be a oud player. Uh, and these were the kinds of um, confrontations that would lead to them you know, saying, well, maybe we have to kind of rethink our position on some of these things. Um, and so those were uh, very kind of heady moments in, in the emergence of this kind of new Islamist movement, one in which you did see this kind of newfound conservatism coming from the youth against elders of the Brotherhood who were part of what you might call this kind of you know, traditional Islamic modernist message that goes back to the days of Hassan Banna. And so there was a kind of amalgamation of all of these different influences um, that the group had to kind of carry forward quite delicately, in fact. And we see it in uh, the literature. We see it in a lot of the kinds of books, the magazines, the things that were being produced at that time that was meant to kind of correct the views of the wayward youth while at the same time trying to kind of accommodate some as aspects of it. So even, for instance, when they would reprint you know, Hassan Banna himself, the founder of the Brotherhood, uh, many of the youth would kind of go through and look at his, his writings, and if they found something that seemed objectionable by the standards of you know, the late 70s, they would just have those things completely expunged. So his more sympathetic views towards Sufism, for instance, were things that they thought were you know, not in keeping with, with the things that they wanted to see being expressed uh, in that period. Um, and so that's kind of the, the way that this movement comes together by the late 1970s. The Muslim Brotherhood has kind of reasserted itself in spite of the fact that it's still at that point remained illegal, and the state kind of was quite perturbed at the idea that the Brotherhood has somehow returned. But again, given its popularity, given the kind of uh, support that it had received, and the fact that it had uh, made very strong commitments to the fact that it maintained a very moderate message, that it spoke out against the kind of militant violence that was erupting around Egypt. So the state was clearly far more focused on uh, those kinds of, of uh, elements and less focused on the idea of trying to repress the Muslim Brotherhood. That tends to, sh to change at the very end of Sadat's presidency when things were kind of beginning to fall apart. In September, just a month before his assassination in 1981, he basically has all of the different 
uh, political factions within Egypt arrested. All Islamists, all leftists, all liberals were basically put in prison if they were kind of members of any independent political organization. And this was kind of uh, part of the paranoia, part of the feeling that he was beginning to kind of lose his grip on Egyptian society. Um, but aside from those kind of late stages, most Egyptians today would say that the Sadat era, you know, if we're going back in the last 60 years, was by far the most kind of open, free period in uh, modern Egypt that we can actually look at as a place where people could more or less say what they wanted, that they could kind of speak out very aggressively against what the regime was doing, um, that they, you know, were able to express themselves in ways and organize in ways. And, you know, Sadat had taken, for instance, the National Guard outside of the university campuses and allowed the campuses to be places that were relatively free in terms of the kinds of expressions and things that were being permissible until the very end when he kind of completely decided to clamp down um, at that stage. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of nostalgia that exists with the 1970s. And it was really interesting during the course of my field work and interviews and people talking about this period in relation to when I was doing my field work, which was at the very late years of the Mubarak era, when people said, you know, this kind of thing was no longer possible the moment Hosni Mubarak um, takes office. Um, but looking at the way that, that this period then uh, influences things going forward, you end up having a number of interesting and important developments that I would argue are really at the core of the kinds of things that um, really uh, sort of started to come out after the uprising. Um, and one of those has to do with the ways in which um, the internal divisions within the Muslim Brotherhood, many of which were kind of really beneath the surface. They didn't like to kind of air the internal divides within the organization, but you do start to see uh, cracks of this toward the end of the Mubarak period. And this is part of a much more long-term trend in which you do get two tendencies within the organization that go back to that original debate that was being had in the early 1970s. Um, and those two trends generally are people who believed in having an insular organization, one was that was far more inward looking, that was focused on having a strong structure, this internal discipline and hierarchy, um, and one that was a little bit more distrustful of society. It believed that the next wave of repression was just around the corner, and the only way that this organization was going to survive it is by being really uh, strong, disciplined, maintaining secrecy as kind of uh, you know one of their their utmost sort of priorities. And this was part of um, what you might call the kind of neo kutbist right? That these were people who in many ways were veterans of the kind of 50s and 60s experience. And they knew that you know state repression would threaten to completely dismantle and destroy the organization. And unless we kind of maintained in institutional purity, uh, that you know this movement could simply be washed away. Um, and on the other hand, you had people who were part of this new generation, part of the kind of 1970s student movement, who had come to Islamic activism through the course of their engagement with society and eventually even engagement with the state. And they really believed that the only way that this movement could move forward is by being far more engaged within society, that you had to kind of take part in all of the kind of bigger programs and movements that were taking place, that you had to reach out to other groups that were not necessarily part of the Islamist group or at least not even members of the Muslim Brotherhood per se. Um, they believed in active engagement within things like the professional syndicates and unions within um, the parliament itself, right? That many of these people were the ones who decided we need to run as independents, we need to find a way to kind of get involved with the state, get involved in, in its institutions and within the system more broadly, and find a way to, to really create change through this kind of agenda of gradual reformism. Uh, and so those two groups quite often clashed. Uh, we, we see this in the way that the elections of the Guidance Bureau were taking place, that the number of the leadership positions were often divided between people who agreed with one school of thought versus another school of thought. And primarily, it was the first group who managed to usually have their, um, their you know, the majority of the votes or was, was able to kind of dominate that process while kind of creating a little bit of space for the kind of minority position to be able to kind of express themselves in the ways that they, they wanted. Um, and in many ways, this was interesting because one of the developments that then you start to see is the fact that members of this kind of first initial group were likely to jump on board with those other efforts the moment that they became successful. So that the moment that the, student, the uh, professional syndicates and, and unions elections were becoming successful, all of a sudden you start to see people who are part of the kind of core leadership of the Brotherhood saying, okay, now we need to kind of control this process given how successful we've been. We see this later on with the parliamentary elections, uh, so much so that by 2005, of course, famously, the Muslim Brotherhood ran 
uh, a number of candidates and ended up winning 88 seats in the Egyptian parliament, which was historically unprecedented. It was 20% of the parliament. They all ran as independents. Again, here's this outlawed organization that now controls 20% of the Egyptian parliament. Um, and at that point, there were some negotiations that were taking place between the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood and the Mubarak regime in a way to kind of create the situation where uh, they were becoming the kind of accommodationists, right? That they were saying, we're not going to touch these issues. As long as you give us this space to do these things, we will kind of create our own um, agendas in ways that do not interfere with the bigger projects of the regime. And at this point, the big project of the regime, of course, was this kind of her hereditary project, right? That, that Mubarak's ultimate goal was to find a way to facilitate the transition of power upon his death. At this point, you know, he was well into his 80s. There were all these kinds of um, decisions that had to be made about who would come in as his successor. And of course, he was trying to position his son, Gamal Mubarak, as being the kind of next president of Egypt. Um, and this was a project that was not just being opposed by people within Egyptian civil society. You, of course, you see the rise of the Kafaya movement as being kind of a direct response to this. Um, but even, of course, within the military. And I, th and I think that this is really where, in many ways, it's kind of helpful to see the events of the last four years in light of that kind of discussion that was being had internally within the Egyptian state, and then, of course, more broadly within Egyptian society, is what is going to happen in, in the event that Egypt needs a successor president. Is it simply going to be passed on to the son, who doesn't have any real strong connections to the military, who is far more likely to kind of bring in his sort of business cronies and the people who are part of this kind of new uh, neoliberal elite that's been established in Egypt in the late Mubarak era? Um, or is the military going to somehow step in? And so there's one narrative that views the entire events of the Egyptian revolution as just simply being the people kind of handing power back to the military in, at the expense of the Mubarak family. Uh, and that the military kind of, that was sitting around kind of scratching his he its head and wondering, well, how are we going to do this? while well, the people kind of did it for them. Um, and so that's kind of one way to understand those events to a certain extent. But then, of course, we go back to this question of, well, where does the Muslim Brotherhood fit in within all of this? Um, and I think that when we see, for instance, their, their uh, accommodationism within the regime, that there was certainly a lack of desire to confront the regime on this issue. That even if none of them had really a taste for the idea that the Mubarak family would continue to rule over Egypt, but they, they realized that this was seen as kind of a red line issue, that the entire future of the organization would be threatened should they stand up to Mubarak's hereditary project. Um, and so this is ha in one way to explain how the 2005 elections actually um, happened. Um, and to a lesser extent, you can see this is also why they weren't taking part in things like the Kifaya movement and other sort of more directly confrontational mobilizations that were taking place in the lead up to the 2011 um, uprising. And this is where I think we get to one of the really kind of ironic moments of uh, the revolution, is that for all of its history, the Muslim Brotherhood has been accused of being this kind of radical revolutionary force. And they've been trying to prove to people that we're not a revolutionary movement. We're not trying to overthrow the state. We're not trying to impose our own kind of, you know, totalitarian Islamic state um, on people. And people didn't really want to believe them at that stage. But then, of course, we get to a point where Egypt is experiencing a revolutionary moment. And the Brotherhood quite typically adopts a much more reformist approach to uh, the kind of post-Mubarak transition. And everyone seems all of a sudden very frustrated that they're not being revolutionary, right? Um, that this is essentially, I think, the way to understand the Brotherhood's posture in the aftermath of Mubarak's overthrow is that they immediately jumped on this idea that Egypt was not going to experience a true revolution, that it simply was going to adopt a gradual reformist uh, transition that was going to see the emergence of um, these kind of democratic institutions that would simply be kind of superimposed onto the previous authoritarian regime as opposed to kind of completely doing away with those institutions. Um, and this is where I think the first split happens between them and the kind of broader revolutionary camp that existed within Egypt, that people who really wanted to see the military excluded from that transition, that wanted to see an overhaul of the judiciary of a number of the other state institutions, uh, whereas the Brotherhood kind of immediately signs on in, uh, in March of 2011 to the referendum that the military has basically posed, right? The military ruling council that's kind of overseeing the transition issues a referendum in which they say, you follow our roadmap, you'll have elections for parliament and for presidency, and then eventually we'll rewrite a constitution. In the meantime, the constitution is suspended, and the military will be the only force that is able to actually issue constitutional decrees 
that dictate how this process will unfold and also how Egypt will be governed in the interim. Um, and so by accepting that in those initial stages, the Brotherhood had kind of signed off on this idea that it will refuse to confront any of the institutions of the old regime and will simply adopt this kind of reformist uh, approach because they thought, of course, that they were in a great position to carry the kind of revolutionary process forward through legitimizing themselves in all of these elections. And of course, they did this spectacularly, right? They won the parliamentary elections at the end of 2011. They won the presidency in summer of 2012. And so there seemed to be some kind of transition that would have allowed for them to kind of sort of get into the state's institutions and be able to gradually reform them, or at least that was the theory. Whereas, in fact, uh, the actual ability of the Brotherhood to really enact any serious changes uh, was quite limited by the fact that you, ha you still had those kind of uh, what you know, people call the deep state, but it's really just the state, right? It's just the institutions <laughs> of any kind of state that is resistant to the kind of radical changes and reforms that, um, that are necessary in order to take a state from the kind of previous you know, authoritarian system to something like a you know, freestanding democracy that has strong uh, institutional constraints on power. Um, and we see this, for instance, in the way that the uh, judges, the, the high court, overturns the Egyptian parliament, right? In, in the early summer of uh, 2012, they simply, with a stroke of a pen, decide the parliament is not null and void, and they send everybody home. And then the Brotherhood decides, well, now we'll just put all of our eggs in the presidential basket. If we can elect a strong president, maybe he can come in and kind of make the changes himself. Well, the night before the runoff in which Morsi was elected, the military also, with just the stroke of a pen, decides to issue a constitutional decree, stripping the presidency of all of its powers. This was before we even knew who was going to be the president. And so Morsi is elected to president. No one really knows what powers he has because the military has effectively stripped him of all of those powers. Um, and so I think, if anything, the biggest mistake that Morsi and the Brotherhood made was convincing people that he was in power when, in fact, I don't believe that he ever was. And uh, I think that by doing so, he ends up being in a position where he actually ends up having to absorb all of the blame for the lack of stability, the continued economic uh, crisis that Egypt is experiencing during this period, and of course, the kind of energy cuts and fuel shortages and all the rest of it that kind of comes about. Couple that with the fact that you still have this very aggressive state media that was kind of, um, in many ways, uh, kind of inciting against the Brotherhood in particular, but also against uh, you know, Morsi in the revolution even more broadly, and you end up having a kind of situation where by uh, the summer of 2013, the situation is quite ripe for a counter-revolution. Um, now you add, of course, the fact that you have a number of revolutionary elements who are quite unhappy with the Brotherhood as well, and the situation gets a bit more complex because these are people who, from the very beginning, were quite consistent in the fact that they rejected the entire transition. They wanted to go back to the kind of clean slate revolution where we get rid of all of the um, elements of the former regime. Uh, the problem, of course, is that they ended up putting their lot in with the military's intervention on the 3rd of July, that, which was basically the coup that overthrew not just Morsi and the Brotherhood, but effectively ended the entire revolutionary process altogether. Um, and did it under the cover of still being part of the revolution. Um, and so I think that this is, this is the kind of uh, narrative that has quite often been contested, that we've seen a number of other um, counter narratives that have emerged specifically coming from the regime and its sort of official media to try to continue to paint this as still being a continuation of the revolution. I don't know that anyone watching the events today could, could you know, with a straight face say that Egypt is still going through its revolutionary transition. Um, but certainly that seems to be at least the, uh, the official narrative of the state, but clearly given the, the crackdown not just against the Brotherhood, but against all independent um, political forces, including many of whom supported Sisi in his early days uh, of his presidency, or at least of, of the coup, um, who find themselves currently imprisoned or facing charges, uh, that again, this, this is kind of taking Egypt back to a situation where there is no outlet for any kind of popular expression from within society, and it's really a kind of state-controlled, uh, centralized politics uh, that in many ways is exerting itself in a way that's far more aggressive than anything that's come before. And part of that is, I think, to kind of restore the so-called fear barrier, right? That everyone said that after Tahrir and after Mubarak, that the so-called fear barrier, that psychological barrier of people uh, being afraid to mobilize for many decades was broken. Well, this is the this, this sort of excessive use of force that the state has been employing in the last uh, year and a half is really in many ways to try to kind of reinstate that, uh, that fear barrier. Uh, 
Um, and so going forward, I think the Brotherhood does face a number of very significant questions. Uh, we see it by the fact that you know, a number of the youth members, especially those who are in exile, are kind of starting to publicly express their demands for internal reforms within the organization, taking responsibility for the mistakes that they've made throughout the transition, taking a more uh, explicitly revolutionary track and not this kind of gradual reformism, um, and to kind of broaden itself and open itself enough to work with other factions within society and not attempt to kind of dominate the process. So those are kind of the major demands that are being made from within the kind of youth ranks, the current youth ranks. Um, against the kind of elders of the organization. Um, and I think that, you know, depending on how the leadership responds, so far they've been quite resistant to those calls. Uh, but in the future, I think that the, the survival of the organization will really depend on its ability to once again, as it did back in the 1970s, to show itself able to, um, to respond to those demands and to really adapt to the kind of changing situation uh, that exists there. So I'll, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave my comments there and I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.